verse 25 it says, He shall stir up his power and his courage against the king of the south with a great army, and the king of the south shall be stirred up to battle with a very great and mighty army, but he shall not stand, for they shall forecast devices against him. Again, one of your 16 times it's mentioned the word devices, and I think it also refers to some magic that's going on, and we'll get to that later. Uh, verse 26 says, Yea, they that feed of the portion of his meat shall destroy him, and his army shall overflow, and many shall fall down slain. And both these kings' hearts shall be to do mischief, and they shall speak lies at one table, but it shall not prosper, for yet the end shall be at the time appointed. Now notice in verse 28, so it says, Then shall he return into his land with great riches, and his heart shall be against the holy covenant, and he shall do exploits and return to his own land. So if he's against the holy covenant, the holy covenant isn't the covenant, the seven-year covenant he made with Israel. Because that's not holy. It's, he's working deceitfully under that. The holy covenant is a reference to the law. The law covenant that God made with Israel. If you're reading through your Bible, we read that this week over in Exodus 20 and I think over in 24 and those chapters over there. And so he had promised that he's going to abide by that holy co covenant, the law covenant. He brings in sacrifices and oblations to make it look like he's doing it. But really... As we saw in verse 23, once that league is made, he works deceitfully. And he starts to get more and more away from that. Well, now after this battle here, uh, he's got these great riches. And then what we're in then at that point is that last half of the tribulation period. He's got more power as the beast. We mentioned that as a man, he just comes in with flatteries and peace and uh, deceives people. But then as a beast... He comes out of the bottomless pit, that last half of the tribulation period. He has more power. That's why he is able to become a world ruler. Not only is he deceitful, but then he's got the power as well. So with that power as the beast, he is able to win this great victory here halfway through the tribulation period and return to his land with great riches. So now that he's got the power, so initially he gets it by making that appearing to be following the Jewish religious, the covenant that God made with Israel in the book of Exodus, but he's working deceitfully behind the scenes, getting away from that, just having a, an appearance of following that covenant. And then when he gets the power as the beast, after he wins this war with the king of the south, now he doesn't really have to follow that anymore because he's got the power, no one can stop him. Now, of course, God's going to stop him at the end, but... Um, at this time, he so he has great riches, so now his heart is against the Holy Covenant, so now he can fully implement the Babylonian religious system. That's why he takes away the sacrifices and the oblation. That's why he sits in the temple, proclaims himself to be God, and that's why he sets up the abomination of desolation. The two witnesses are gone. He's got power as the beast. He's overthrown, uh, got great riches here with this battle against the king of the south, and so now he is God as far as that's what he's telling people he appears to be God because of his great power and uh, now he can do whatever he wants to do so now he can set that's why the image of the beast comes up he's able to institute capital punishment for those who will not bow down to the image or take the mark of the beast so he's got a lot more power here um, I wrote in I wrote on your outline uh, once the Antichrist has control he completely forsakes the law of covenant. That's what we read there in Daniel 11, 28. And aligns with certain lewd fellows of the baser sort. Uh, that's a great phrase that's found in Acts 17, verse 5. Uh, but really, all that means is that um, instead of following, you know, in other words, at first he made a covenant and he had these Jewish religious people like the Pharisees. Well, the Pharisees, even though they were they had their own religious system, you know, setting up the abomination of desolation in the temple would have been against what the Pharisees would allow. Uh, as, and, you know, other things that he does. Well, now he sort of, he forsakes those people, the religious people, and because he's forsaken that covenant, now he aligns himself with people that are these lewd fellows of the baser sort. In other words, he aligns himself with people who are just in it for the riches and the power and they don't really care anything at all about God and His Word and the covenant. 
So this is, you know, where the evil comes in. So that's why he is, so he forsakes the Holy Covenant and he aligns himself with people who were like him. So at first he aligned himself with religious people to get the power and he seemed to follow religion and now he has the power and the riches where he can forsake those people and just implement that Babylonian religious system, have people worship him and his image directly. Uh, so verse 28, uh, Daniel 11, 28, Then shall he return into his land with great riches and his heart shall be against the holy covenant he shall do exploits and return to his own land. At the time appointed, he shall return and come toward the south, but it shall not be as the former or as the latter. So now we see what he does in the last half of the tribulation period. Verse 30, For the ships of Shittim shall come against him. Therefore he shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the holy covenant. So shall he do. He shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the holy covenant. There's his alignment with those lewd fellows of the baser sort, aligning them with people who completely disregard God's word, that forsake the holy covenant. Verse 31, And arms shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and they shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate, that's the image of the beast. Verse 32, And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries, um, but the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. The people that know their God is the believing remnant. They go about, and we see in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that Jesus sends them out to go with the lost sheep of the house of Israel. The exploits they do would be healing the sick, casting out devils, proclaiming the gospel so that people may be saved. They, so they're doing it. The little flock of Israel is doing something different. Uh, the Antichrist has got his evil people that he's aligned with for the last half. They've polluted the sanctuary, taken away the sacrifices, set up an image, a uh, false god in the temple there, and they're doing wickedly against the covenant. And the people that he's aligned themselves with, he aligned himself with they're going to go along with it because they corrupt, uh, they've been corrupted by the flatteries of the Antichrist. He's going to come along and tell them what great riches he's going to give them, which he has at that time, and how they're going to be great in his kingdom. And so they are corrupted and they go right along with it. Verse 33, They that understand among the people shall instruct many, yet they shall fall by the sword and by flame, by captivity and by spoil many days. So you do see the believing remnant there, and they're able to heal the sick, cast out devils, proclaim the gospel of the kingdom. But because of the great power of the Antichrist, um, they, are, they fall by the sword, by flame, by captivity. We see over in Revelation chapter 6 the souls of those who were slain for the testimony they held that are underneath the altar. Uh, so that's the persecution that Jesus talks about of the believing remnant. That's why when we read over in Matthew 24, he sees when you see the abomination, the desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy temple, those who are in Judea, he says, flee to the mountains. Um, don't take, don't even go down to the housetop. Don't take anything with you because at that time, then you've got these wicked people here who are going to give you the death penalty if you stay there. So he says, get out of there. And we see here that the little flock here in verse 33, that they are going to fall by sword, by flame, by captivity, and by spoil. Um, and one thing he does, if we continue down in verse 36, uh, and this is your next fill in the blank, is that the beast uses forces or magic to exalt himself above all gods and claims that he is God. And we read that in 2 Thessalonians already. The beast uses forces to exalt himself above all gods and claims that he is God. And we'll read that here in Daniel 11, verse 36. So he's got these wicked people aligned with him. He's got great power, great wealth. And now his God is going to be the God of forces. Daniel 11.36 says, And the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the God of gods, that's the Lord God Jehovah there, speaking against him, and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished, for that that is determined shall be done. <coughs> Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, meaning the God of Israel, nor the desire of women, nor regard any god, for he shall magnify himself above all. 
but in his estate shall he honor the God of forces. And a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things. Thus shall he do in the most strongholds with a strange God whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory. And he shall cause them to rule over many and shall divide the land for gain. So his God is this God of forces. It's magic or sorcery, witchcraft, whatever you want to call it. That's the things he's doing. Uh, we're told in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 that he comes about, he does these lying signs and wonders. And that's where the deceit comes along because he'll do these great miracles and they'll think, well, the Christ was supposed to do miracles. He's doing miracles. He's sitting in the temple as God. No one is stopping him. So he's going to deceive a lot of people into thinking he is the Christ. And in fact, we just read in Revelation 13 that he ascended up out of the sea as the beast. Well, what does the Christ do? The Christ, we know that he died for the sins of Israel. He was buried and he rose again the third day. What does the Antichrist do? He's destroyed by the two witnesses, which Satan will declare that that's Satan's people. It's not God's people. And he dies. He's probably uh, not around for three days. And then he rises from the dead coming out of the sea. Satan resurrects him. So he looks like the Christ. He was died, rose again, probably the third day. He is sitting in the temple as God. He is conquering kingdoms. He is doing miracles. Um, everybody, Israel, is aligned themselves with him. I mean, he looks just like the Christ. Of course, the difference is, is he's going against the Holy Covenant. He's going against the law. So the people of God, those who believe God and his word, are going to look at what he does, compare it to the Holy Covenant, and say, this is an imposter. We're not believing him. And so God's going to work through them. They're going to preach the gospel of the kingdom. But most people, because, you know, just like today, um, you <clears throat> preach the gospel, they don't believe it. They don't believe God's word. So a lot of people are going to believe what they see the Antichrist doing and saying, well, he looks like he's the Christ. I'm going to follow him. He says, bow down to his image. I'm going to bow down. He says, take the mark. I'm going to take the mark. And a lot of people are going to do that. Um, so the way he does those things, though, is with these, the God of forces, you know, being a magic, sorcery, uh, whatever you want to call it. So he does these lying signs and wonders to, get, to deceive people, uh, to get them to follow him. Um, and your final point, uh, if we go back to chapter 8, is another thing that's going to be convincing is that the Antichrist even has angels on his side. Uh, that's your fill in the blank there. The Antichrist even has angels on his side. And we get that from Daniel 8, uh, starting in verse 9. Daniel 8, verse 9. And out of one of them came forth a little horn. There's your Antichrist again, the little horn which waxed exceeding great toward the south and toward the east and toward the pleasant land. And it waxed great even to the host of heaven. The host of heaven would be angels and you know, those spiritual beings that God created in heavenly places. Um, even to the host of heaven. And it cast down some of the host and of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host, even to the Lord Jesus Christ himself, he's magnifying him. And by him, the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. And a host was given him against the daily sacrifice. So he's actually got some angels on his side, a host of heaven, some angelic creatures there on his side. Uh, it says, and it cast down the truth to the ground, and it practiced and prospered. Practice. There's your magic, the lying signs and wonders. Um, I believe that, and I could be wrong, but I believe that the host of heaven that he cast down here are actually angels that are on God's side. I think he's so great that he wins a battle against uh, some angelic forces. The reason I say that is because of what we see in verse 13. Uh, as we keep reading, it says, verse 13, Then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint which spake, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation, to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? And he said unto me, 
unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Um, that's six years and 140 days. I don't know exactly what that refers to. I would assume that uh, the time that he wins this battle against the host of heaven would be approximately, um, you know, the difference there, 220 days into that seven-year tribulation period. So you take uh, seven years, you subtract the six years and 140 days, and that leaves 220 days. So it appears as this little horn comes up, makes the covenant, 220 days into the tribulation period approximately is when he wins this battle against uh, angels of God. They are trodden underfoot. But, of course, when Jesus' second coming, then he will um, relieve those angels and that battle that the Antichrist wins um, will, you know, God will overcome that. Jesus will overcome them. Those angels will be released from being trodden underfoot. Uh, God will take them out of that situation and they'll be with God forever. Um, even if it's not God's angels, it appears to be, or else they wouldn't be trodden underfoot or cast to the ground. Uh, even if it is Satan's forces, uh, the bottom line is you have, not only does the Antichrist win these victories on earth, over kings on the earth, but he's also winning spiritual victories. He's casting down some of the angelic host and winning a victory over that. So um, you see a great power that the Antichrist has, especially in the last three and a half years when he is the beast. Uh, of course, the good news is that in the end, uh, Jesus Christ comes and he overcomes, throws down the Antichrist and the false prophet. They're thrown in the lake of fire. Um, you have the wicked people that align himself. God destroys them. And at the same time, these hosts of heaven would return back to God's side as well. And then the kingdom will be God's. Uh, but you can see how people would be deceived because of all the things that the Antichrist does to make himself look like the true Christ. And he's even able to win a victory um, over some of the host of heaven here. So uh, you wrote in your outline that in summary, uh, for the seven-year period here, the Antichrist starts as a man, gains power by flatteries and magic. Halfway through the tribulation period, the devil concentrates all his power in him, making him a beast. He rules the world and looks like he is God. Um, so that's when we're in Revelation 13 and we see the beast rising up out of the sea. Um, that's what he's doing and that's the power that he's going to have. And so when we go through Revelation 13 through 22, we're focusing on that last half of the tribulation period. We're going to see all the things he does, but at the same time, we're going to see Jesus at his second coming overcome him at the end. It's not that the Antichrist is more powerful or Satan is more powerful than God. That's not the case. It's rather that God allows these things to happen. And when the time comes at the end, when all of Israel is saved, then Jesus Christ comes, the second coming. He puts an end to all of that and he establishes his kingdom on earth. So, yes, sir. In 1137, where it says, Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers. What does that tell you? That he, he's a Jew, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. The anti—that's a good point. The Antichrist is a Jew, yeah. uh, probably from Assyria, uh, right. an Assyrian Jew. You find uh, that in Isaiah, I it is. Yeah, I think so. But that's another. Yeah, talked about the points as far as why they would think he's the Messiah. That's another point: is that he's a Jew. He's if come to save his people. I might believe Obama was. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Obama came in by yeah. flatteries. Yeah. He's taking over. And yeah, he fits everything but that, don't he? Yeah. <laughs> All right. With that, um, let's close with a word of prayer. Uh, dear Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you that you've got everything in control, even during this time of the tribulation period, where we see the Antichrist and his great rule and power. Uh, we thank you that uh, even in that time, it's, it's because you allow this to happen so that all Israel may be saved. And we just trust in you that your word has been faithful. And we continue to trust that it will be faithful, that you will come. You will set up your kingdom and all power and glory will go back to God where it rightly deserves. So we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen.